ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's really a great honor to be the first presenter of today and to give you a little insight in my PhD projects on the topic of predictive and prognostic biomarkers in urooncology. My name is Tomás Fazekas and I'm working at the Department of Urology in the Semmelweis University. I have to tell you my vision. I strongly believe that with the development of precision medicine and individual molecular, molecular targeted therapy, the life expectancy and life quality of cancer patients can be highly improved. And in line with this vision, my mission is to find biomarkers which can guide optimal therapy sequencing in both prostate and bladder cancers. Well, according to this vision and mission, now let me introduce you my two specific projects in which are pretty much related with each other. In both of them, we are assessing the so-called BRCA or BRCA positive metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer patients. So let's move on with the first project in which we are assessing the treatment responses to abirateron, enzalutamine, and docetaxel treatment. But to start with, why should we talk about prostate cancer? because this is the most common type of cancer of males. One out of eight men will develop it sometimes during their life. And 10% of the advanced cases are the so-called BRCA or BRCA mutation positive ones. And why, is it, why does it matter at all? Because the BRCA mutated prostate cancer is a much more aggressive disease. These patient survival is 50% shorter compared to the Y type ones. And besides the different biologic activity, these patients represent a different clinical entity as well. We have an on-label targeted therapy for them, the PARP inhibitors, but currently they can only be given from the second treatment line. And the question of which first line available treatment from abirateron, enzalutamid, and docetaxel is the best for these patients has remained unknown until now. So uh, our aim with this meta-analysis is to assess the therapeutic response to the first line available treatments. For this purpose, we set up two clinical questions. In the first one, we were assessing the so-called PSA 50 response, defined as a PSA decrease at least 50% from the baseline. And their second question was on the topic of progression-free survival. For this, we used individual patient data and compared the agents to one another. Now let's move on with the results. PSA 50 in the first treatment line. We could assess almost 100 patients, and in case of abirateron, 52% responded. And in case of enzalutamide, this response rate was 64. And uh, in, in case of docetaxel, 55% of the patients responded. So based on this, you can see that enzalutamide treated patients had the highest response rate. Now let's talk about progression-free survival. On the following survival curves from the different articles, you can see the enzalutamide and abirateron treated patients, and you can, you can mark a trend towards a better survival with enzalutamide. And based on our random effect cochrane regression model, we found that enzalutamide treated patients has a 53% lower risk for progression. Well, to sum up things, on the one hand, I have to tell you that this is the first meta-analysis uh, in the literature providing a comprehensive overview with these outcomes in this novel subgroup of patients, and we could use individual, individual patient data with baseline characteristics. Of course, we have to talk about our limitations as well. First of all, I would like to highlight the small sample size, and there are no studies comparing directly the agents resulting in a, in a different uh, kind of statistical approach. And I have to add that the, our progression-free survival outcome was a composite outcome leading to a potential uh, bias, and the BRCA mutation test method may have differed among the studies leading to, to, again, to a potential source of bias. But what can we take home from all this? First of all, we were the first to show that BRCA positive patients respond to all standard first line available treatments. And the enzalutamide treatment treated patients had the highest PSA 50 response rate, and it seemed to, they seemed to have a better progression-free survival compared to the abirateron treated ones. And it's really important from the everyday clinical practice that now we know that BRCA positive patients, you can use any of the treatments. However, we have to know that, that there can be differences uh, too between the, the, uh, the three administered agents. And with this study, we would like to highlight the importance of molecular marker-driven interventional RCDs to compare abirateron, enzalutamine, and docetaxel to one another. And to sum up the first project, I'm really happy to uh, show you that uh, our article has been accepted in a 
very good urological journal. And here I would like to thank you for all of you who helped in the design and, uh, and um, in doing, uh, who worked in this uh, project. So now let's move on to the second project with, in which we are assessing the later line treatment options in the same population. What can I add to metastatic prostate cancer? It's a really deadly disease. The five-year survival of uh, MCRPC patients is, uh, is only 30%, despite the fact that you can give so many different kinds of treatments. So optimal sequencing is really crucial nowadays to achieve a better survival and life quality for these patients. So in this meta-analysis, we wanted to assess the later line treatment options. The PARP inhibitors and platinum treatments are currently on-label targeted therapies for BRCA positive patients, and the, the cabazitoxel and PSMA ligand therapies are emerging novel uh, therapeutic options in MCRPC as well. For this purpose, we use the same methodology with the same outcomes and the same uh, questions. And we perform the systematic search, starting from um, five or 6,000 uh, articles and ended up with 23 articles. And now let me present you our uh, results. In this study, we could uh, reach a really uh, high volume of uh, patient. Uh, 700 patients uh, is included in the statistical analysis. For PARP inhibition, 69% responded. In case of platinum, 77% responded. And for cabazitoxin and PSMA ligand, 28 and 50% of the patients responded. And now, if we just take a look at on the response rates of the two on-label treatments, the PARP inhibitors and platinum ones, you can see that there is no subgroup difference between the, uh, the two on-label uh, agents. And what can we say, and, and I could say that this is endorsed by the overall survival data, we found no difference between the two uh, agents in uh, terms of overall survival. So currently we are drafting the manuscript and we would like to, uh, to uh, submit it in uh, January. And to sum up things, again, this is the first meta-analysis with these outcomes and uh, with these uh, agents in this topic. In this study, we could reach a really high sample size in case of PARP inhibitors and platinum treatment, and we could use individual patient data again. Of course, we have to talk about our pitfalls as well. In, with PSMA ligand and cabazitoxel, our sample size was really uh, low, and there are no studies, again, comparing two agents directly to one another. And there are currently, there are only prospective trials available for uh, PARP inhibitors, not to the uh, other treatments in this molecular selected um, uh, population. So what can we conclude from all these? We have shown that BRCA positive patients respond to all on-label later line uh, therapeutic uh, options to PARP inhibitors and platinum. And the PSA 50 response and overall survival data showed that platinum is completely comparable to PARP inhibitor treatment. And it's really important for uh, the everyday clinician because platinum, which is much more cheaper and has been used for, I would say, decades in uh, oncology, is a valid treatment option besides PARP inhibitor, which is a new and more expensive molecularly targeted treatment in this patient group. However, we have to note that interventional RCTs and even prospective trials are needed and are currently ongoing uh, in, ca in case of platinum treatment. And one very, very important and hot topic is the optimal sequencing of these two agents because there is data in the literature that they may be cross-resistant. So uh, there is really uh, a lack of data uh, in the literature regarding the uh, sequencing of the two on-label agents. So this is a must for the future. I would like to, uh, so these were the two uh, projects which you have heard about. The first one, I would say it's uh, completed, and the second one, we are working currently on the second one and plan to submit it in uh, January. I would like to uh, finish my uh, presentation with the words of San Francisco of Assisi, which, which um, was my motto in the uh, past uh, one and a half year, that you should start by doing what is necessary and then what is possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. Thank you for your kind at attention. Yeah, I just started to wonder that uh, the sample sizes uh, in these trials are very low, but you are presenting that uh, one out of eight men uh, may 
if I can't, uh, some of us will have prostate cancer <laughs> soon. But uh, you, you have really small sample sizes. What, what is the reason behind this, first of all? And second, uh, I was just wondering in the first uh, uh, study that uh, also this may be true for both of your, uh, your meta-analysis, that how homogeneous are, are these patient groups? Uh, can we say that, that uh, one, one treatment will be more effective in all uh, this kind of patients or uh, do we have to stratify this patient group in, uh, based on more criteria? Thank you for your uh, questions. So the answer for the first one is that, uh, that uh, fortunately not many, so fortunately prostate cancer so unfortunately, prostate cancer is really common, but fortunately, if it's uh, uh, diagnosed in an early phase, it can be cured. And there are many indolent diseases which are not, which you don't really have to do anything with it. So nowadays, in the Western countries, prostate cancer actually is overdiagnosed. That's why the active surveillance and watchful waiting protocols has really emerged in the past uh, five or six years. And this, all this data is about the advanced cases. So with metastatic disease and with the castration resistant disease, which means that despite the fact of androgen deprivation, the, the, uh, the uh, disease is progressing. So this patient, this patient group fortunately represents a smaller uh, uh, um, population than to the general prostate cancer population. And the other, um, answer for this is uh, that, especially in the first project, the, there are big trials assessing enzalutamide and, uh, and all these agents, but in not many of them, the molecular, um, molecular uh, sequencing of the data has been done. So that's why we don't have that much data. And of course, you can see a shift in the second project towards a higher patient volume. Of course, because PARP inhibitors are on label, and currently they can be given only in case of BRCA positivity. So uh, that's why, of course, those phase two trials were based on molecular tests, and they se sequenced all the all the uh, 5,000 patients who has been screened for a, for a BRCA, and then rolled in 100 patients. That's why we have the higher patient numbers in the second project. You actually set up some very important questions at the end. Is there any realistic hope for doing actually a randomized clinical trials on any of you? I mean, here, initiating or, or, or just getting a part of a big <coughs> OPN or whatever? Um, well, to, to be honest, I, I wouldn't think that uh, we uh, would be um, able to uh, do anything like this. And uh, I have to be. So I have to say that the world is changing towards the uh, combination uh, treatments, which is not included in all this. So combination of PARP inhibitors with abiraterone and, and, uh, or, or other uh, antiandrogen agents, and they are going up front in prostate cancer, even in the first uh, treatment lines. So, um, and there is a really uh, hot debate in, on this topic in the literature whether to give PARP inhibitors only to BRCA positive patients or to give it to everybody because they, based on um, basic science data there may be a synergistic effect of the combination treatment but these trials are under uh, the way there is only one trial which has shown that uh, I would say controversial data on this <coughs> but this is, these are the future directions which which uh, there is one um, uh, addition to the first project, which uh, we, will, we will and we have to perform. We want an uh, UNKP for that purpose. We will perform it on a prostate cancer cell line. So we will silence the BRCA2 gene and then uh, treat them with, uh, with abiraterone, enzalutamine, and docetaxel and check the cell viability of these cells. And this is uh, going to be an addition from our side to the, uh, to the first project. My question would be related to the diagnostic, the molecular part. Of course, prostate cancer are in a much better situation than, than pancreatic cancer. We are far away behind it. But currently, I just would like to inquire about the practice in your institution. 
So, uh, so for all metastatic cancer, you are doing molecular genetic analysis for germline mutations and so on, how many genes you are uh, uh, testing, and whether how maybe in the western part of Europe do you do NGS for, for every patient, because of course these are the ones which were discovered recently but what the others which haven't been discovered yet. So to get even more knowledge, uh, we need to improve our diagnostic part. So what is the current practice and what is the hope maybe or strategy for the future to have, for example, NGS for all metastatic mm. patients? Thank you for your question. So uh, currently based on the guidelines, the uh, mutational testing is indicated for every uh, high risk localized disease, so not even metastatic disease, and uh, every metastatic uh, and um, castration resistant uh, patient. We in our institution has uh, the fortunately have the opportunity to uh, to um, send the tissue to oncomine uh, testing to the pathology department, and we are assessing I think uh, more than a hundred genes in this uh, uh, panel. And currently, based on the, um, <coughs> based on the um, um, Professor Niradis uh, wheel, we are even sending high-risk localized uh, disease patients with a very high PSA, and, but without metastasis as well. So we try to uh, send as many patients as we can and convince the clinicians that, uh, <coughs> that uh, they should send more and more patients. And one very important thing is that that we have a genetic uh, uh, specialist, a uh, doctor who, uh, who did his PhD in the States, and now we have uh, one day of genetic consultation in the urology department. And uh, I think that I've heard about that uh, in the Western countries and in the best prostate cancer centers, they even have molecular oncoteams. So when the, not even the, all those who are uh, directly related to the patients are there, but there is a molecular diagnostic specialist from the laboratory, and there is a genetic uh, uh, consultant as well in the onco team. Because if you have a positive result, then it does not mean that they will respond to, uh, to the treatment. So, uh, so we are, I think we have a fortunate situation in the clinic compared to Hungary, and even uh, we are getting closer and closer to the Western quality as well.